Hey everyone, I hope you have a good uh, talk today. And uh, today we are presenting this talk about how do we do the data pipelines at uh, using various Apache projects. My colleague Luciano here uh, will dive deep into the projects while I'll get things started. So my name is uh, Hong Yue Zhang, and I work with uh, Apple Data Platforms. Let's start it. So today the focus will talk about mostly from the data engineering perspective. I see that it's very similar to us as a software developers. There's a lot of things in common. Uh, I think one thing I can think of is that we're both uh, working on a lot of features. When there is something we want, we will build the features doing the prototype and then we will test it out, uh, release them, and then we'll work on something else. So we iterate pretty quickly from time to time, from sprint to sprint, and we will have a similar time of uh, deliverables. The second thing we saw in common uh, in between the data engineering and the software engineering is that oftentimes we inherit a lot of legacies. So it's either about the legacy of the code or legacy of the data. Sometimes uh, we have to work with the code which is developed maybe 10 or 15 years ago. Or many times we need to work with the data which are already in the system in use for uh, many years. So um, I want to say that like, there is a lot of uh, similarity between them. And as a software developer, we develop the tools to be used for the data engineers. And we'll focus today on how do we improve their quality of life and help them improve the productivity. So as a software developers, the thing I enjoy the most is that I can develop a lot of codes using my own laptops. Uh, I have a lot of tools to help me to do that. For example, I'll start with the IDEs. As uh, integrated development environments, uh, it helped me to look through the codes I want and also uh, make some edits test and repeat. So as a cycle, I can do a lot of things just on my own laptops. But the problem is this seems to be very hard for data engineers. Oftentimes, they're more working more with the data than actual code to define its behaviors. And there's the two reasons I see why it doesn't really work for the data engineers. The first is about the volume. So as the software developer, uh, most of the time we work with the code. Those are representing the format of a text, so it's much smaller. Even if we have a, like a hundred thousand or billion uh, number of lines of code, we can compress this text pretty efficiently. And all of this is probably just megabytes or worst case uh, gigabytes. But for the data engineering, they're working with various types of data. Some of them are binaries, some of them are multimedia. It's much harder and much larger in size. So when we work with them, it's really hard to find a large laptop so that we can put everything together all into a single laptop. So that's the nature of the data. And the second part is about collaborations. As a software developer, usually when we collaborate, we're using the virtual control system. We put them into the code repositories, and then we can cut pull requests, issues. It's much easier to collaborate. But think about what if you want to share something else? like your data pipeline, or it's very specific to your data, then collaboration of the data from the data engineer or data scientist perspective, it's actually much more. So as a result, I think uh, we will need something more to help them. For the data engineer, I think a lot of them, they can work around with uh, downsampling. They can reduce their dimensionalities, but when we talk about multiple data scientists together as a group, as a team, I think we will need some solution at the platform levels. So uh, step back, I think what we want to achieve is that we want to build something uh, allow for the easy of data explorations, data experimentations, and also allow them to extract the feature from all these data. And we know that uh, this requires the things we do support is that we want something uh, on the cloud with more elasticity so we can provide a lot more compute resource. And also we want to ability to share data securely, probably with some access controls 
like you want your teammates look at the same data you have the permission, but not someone else from different department or organizations. So uh, I think we are going pretty quickly jump into the notebooks. Notebooks is kind of a de facto solution for us and the data engineering to use. We also want them to have ability to do the self-service. So over here, I think we have about uh, each step uh, corresponding to their data engineering development cycles. First, we'll talk about notebooks, which provide an interactive ability about data exploration and experimentations. Then we will have a Apache Tori project. I believe Luciana will expand on this, how, how this will help us. Then we were using the Apache Spark as a way to scale and process the data. Lastly, uh, we have uh, Apache Unicorns to schedule resource on the Kubernetes-based environments. And Airflows, once we have finalized these data pipelines, we will want to schedule them based on the tr some certain triggers or time. So first thing, let's start with the notebooks, right? So notebook is really nice in terms of interactive UIs. They allow the data engineer to do the task. And it's a de facto standard because there are two things. Uh, for those who are not familiar with, notebook provides this uh, nice UIs interface. So you can combine all of your code, your documentations, and your execution results all together. When I want to demo something about my data pipelines, I can just using a single notebook to achieve everything I want to share with my audience. And the good thing is that the one who review my notebook doesn't need to be technical. They don't need to know all the uh, technical details of the notebooks, but they can see the visualization of this graph and understand what the conclusion we draw from the data. And uh, when we look at this uh, interactive uh, computations, I believe most of the time we're using Jupyter, and uh, because it's a de facto tools we're using in the communities, um, it's kind of uh, very popular since the introduce of the uh, Python. Like we build a lot of uh, libraries and the frameworks around the data using the Pythons. And in the distant second, we'll have the tools like Visual Studio Code. It's being used by the data engineer who has more familiarity with the other development tasks. Like they may develop both the data pipelines and also the libraries used by the software. So according to the Visual Studio Code reports, the Jupyter extension is actually the second most popular uh, extension on the marketplace. So, why do we choose notebooks? Um, there's a few reasons. I don't need to go through them one by one, but most important is about uh, all of the big data integrations. We already have the tools available trying to solve the problems in the language we want. So, Python's, Julius, R's, and Scala's, those are, um, all of them has enough library to be support and we can directly use them into the uh, Jupyter. And uh, another thing we want to talk about, when we have a group of the data scientists together, we want to use Jupyter Hub as a server. So we have certain segregations. So each user, like a Bob or Alice, they can have their own uh, workspace. And, uh, but the resource used to help them to uh, authoring the data pipelines are shared. So for example, they, if they both want to using some Spark clusters to apply the ETLs, uh, they will have a different co uh, workspace for their code, for their testing and verifications. But when they start the Spark job, all this executor resource can be shared from single uh, Kubernetes-based clusters. So that means it's much easier for a single team of SRE to oversee the resource provision in part. Next, uh, we'll talk about, about Tories, how this will help us. Thank you. 
Hey everyone, uh, Luciano here, and um, let me continue with the presentation more on the run times. Uh, so one of the things that we just saw about notebooks is they kind of like a, give you an abstraction of like what you want to use in terms of like language, and those are called kind of like kernels in the context of like Jupyter. And when we want to provide uh, support or capabilities for Scala, uh, that is when uh, we use Apache Tori. Apache Tori will give you uh, access to Spark APIs, uh, create all the great things from Spark, uh, use that very kind of like a, uh, seamlessly when you are uh, using the Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, so when we, when we are talking about Tori and the, the integration that it does with the analytics uh, runtime uh, such as Spark, uh, what we can see is we'll have Jupyter Lab. When you start a notebook, uh, it starts a application uh, calling Apache Tori as a kernel, and then you will have uh, access to a Spark context. You, you can create your session, get executors, and basically start doing anything that uh, uh, you need in terms of analytics without really having to kind of like uh, do any kind of like deployment or anything, uh, really in a self-service fashion, very easy for a data science to be onboarded and start doing their analytics. Uh, but initially we were talking about some of the limitations when we were talking or, or trying to do uh, big data or, or LLMs or different uh, use cases in our laptops when we just use Jupyter Notebooks, one of the limitations of the vanilla notebook is that they want or they expect that all the kernels get started as processes. So you still have that limitation that uh, maybe it's not your laptop, but it's that specific pod that you're running in, uh, what are the resources available there and things like that. To uh, overcome that and provide us more like a, a linear um, uh, scalability in terms of supporting more data scientists, onboarding more data scientists. Um, what we have used is uh, what we call the Jupyter Gateway. Uh, the Jupyter Gateway, what it does is removes the limitation of running all these kernels as a process and make that uh, the ability to run those kernels in a remote way. So to that extent, when you start a notebook, uh, through the gateway, then it will use the whole uh, resources from a Spark cluster to start your application, to start your kernel, and uh, to run executors, giving you a lot more uh, resource availability. And when you need to add a new uh, data scientist to the cluster or to support more of those, uh, you just start adding more nodes to that cluster and you can scale to that, which is not available directly with just the vanilla Jupyter Notebooks. Um, now let's move more to Spark. Uh, how many folks are familiar or use Spark today here? Okay, a lot of the folks. So um, we don't need to go into a lot of details. But basically, Spark will uh, uh, kind of like provide you the runtime where you can get the scalability, process a lot of uh, data, uh, data sets in a distributed way. It also provides support for uh, uh, different uh, uh, data sources, like uh, you can start integrating with uh, Kafka, Postgres, etc. Uh, and also support for like a PySpark if you want to do Python, Scala if you want to do native, uh, etc. But uh, what really I want to touch here is how do you start using Spark in a more kind of like a, a cloud native environment? Uh, what are the options? Uh, what works best? And when we were uh, kind of like a looking into this, I think what we see in the community is basically two different um, uh, options for, for the usage into uh, cloud native. One is kind of like the native Spark on Kubernetes. Uh, the other one, kind of like a, the, the Spark Kubernetes operator. I think a most recently, I think about a month ago, we also have a Kubeflow uh, Spark operator that I think, uh, I haven't spent a lot of time on that, but I think it should be uh, kind of like the next generation of the Kuber uh, Spark Kubernetes operator. Uh, to us, when we were looking into those uh, 
the, the, the Kubernetes operator, I think, provided us a little bit more flexibility in terms of like uh, using the CRDs to customize kind of like the environment. It also, through the CRDs, had the options to enable and, and automatically generate like the Spark UI links and all of that with the right like ingresses and stuff. So kind of like a, we went through that uh, uh, as a choice. Uh, but really, it's very similar, uh, some of the, 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 the basic capabilities if you're just looking to get started uh, in terms of like choosing from uh, the native Spark on Kubernetes versus the Kubernetes operator. Uh, once you're starting to really build a platform and um, you want to self-service, but you also want to enable multi-tenant, uh, you, you, you want to be able to separate or isolate resources for different groups and, and all those kind of stuff that just by using the Spark operator and using the, the Kubernetes uh, scheduler, you will not be able to get those uh, additional uh, capabilities. So one of the things that we integrated with is uh, using the unicorn as uh, Apache unicorn as uh, the scheduler. Uh, Apache Unicorn starts enabling uh, enhanced resource scheduling. You can start uh, scaling your data pipelines execution in a multi-tenant way. Uh, it provides ability to separate key, uh, different groups into queues and all of that uh, capabilities that you are looking for when you're trying to do multi-tenant. Uh, in terms of kind of like uh, some of the additional functionality, and keep in mind that originally uh, Unicorn was designed to be kind of like a user for a batch. So uh, it can do multi-tenants uh, with a hierarchy, uh, complete resource isolation. Uh, you can enforce uh, resource quotas. You have different uh, ways of like uh, managing the workloads and scheduling that, etc. But a lot of the things that we are trying to work here is somewhat something more like interactive, using the notebooks. And it wasn't a perfect match to just get Unicorn, let's put it there, and um, work well for uh, applications that are interactive. Some of the issues that we saw when we were kind of like a, uh, investigating the, the, the difference required for interactive requirements uh, is uh, particularly when you using a queue for running a, a production jobs as well, you have this uh, notion of like a noisy neighbors uh, affecting a lot of the, the interactive jobs. So let's say you have a production job that needs to start uh, 400 nodes or, or like 1,000 nodes uh, to, perform that, to perform that job. What happens by default, uh, Unicorn will complete those 400 nodes or 1,000 nodes before it actually uh, uh, starts your next application because by default it's kind of like first in, first out. Uh, the first thing that we had to change or starting changing there is, is how, how it pro, uh, handled that to FAIR. FAIR enables kind of like a more parallelism there and you won't have to wait for those 400 to be completed. Uh, your application can start, uh, uh, can get started in parallel and you can start uh, not having to see the, the data scientist in front of the computer waiting for that application to start. Uh, another thing is related to kind of like uh, the resources and how the, the, these jobs can start affecting uh, the, the, the behavior of the cluster, how fast those clusters can create nodes and things like that. Another thing that we did to uh, uh, solve or, or at least uh, uh, work around that was to separate some of the queues for interactive jobs. Uh, that way, together with a fair uh, scheduler, uh, starting the interactive jobs for multiple data scientists in parallel became very quick. We were able to, like in a few seconds, uh, really have uh, uh, a notebook, a kernel started and ready to uh, execute code. Uh, so with that, I think you can see uh, pretty much all of the components that we start uh, adding into uh, the, the self-service multi-tenant platform uh, for you to build your application. Once your application is ready, I think uh, the next step is uh, how do we productionalize those applications? How do we uh, get those scheduled, running periodically, uh, and, and all of that? Um, 
and that is when Apache Airflow comes to the rescue. Uh, what is Apache Airflow? Uh, it allows you, it's kind of like a, a platform to programmatically author, schedule, and monitor workflows. You can start building your DAGs. It's a very flexible, uh, and through those DAGs, you can uh, uh, kind of like a join the execution of all your notebooks. You can have also uh, sort of like a op uh, custom operators that does specific tasks that you need. And you can put that schedule to run periodically, like every hour, every day, and so forth. But we really want to focus kind of like on doing our job. And, and, and I don't want to have to learn yet another script language just to get my uh, job scheduled. So uh, Elira is another open source project. It has a visual editor for Airflow. Uh, it is really helpful uh, for a lot of the things that you want to do. It allows you to start dragging and dropping kind of like your notebooks. You can start assembling that in the execution order that you need. It also supports uh, not only the notebooks, but like scripts. So uh, you can have a Python script, or you can have a Scala script, and all of that. Then it has kind of like a, a, a panel for you to specify all the properties of that without having to actually uh, learn or have to do manually that DAG creation. Uh, once you're ready, then you sort of have two options. Uh, if you want an additional customization that is not available directly into uh, the, the, the editor, you can export that into the DAG. And that's kind of like a gets you like a, the very draft, initial draft, and you can start doing the customization. A lot of data engineers might need to do that. Uh, if you're just a data scientist and you just want to schedule that, uh, basically go ahead. There is a button that says play. It will generate the DAG, submit the DAG, and get that scheduled for you in Airflow. Very easy. Click of a button. So uh, uh, really focusing on the productivity and the user experience for the data scientist. And what you get is basically your um, Apache Airflow DAG being executed. So uh, just summarizing uh, all the components, all the uh, things that we saw on our platform, uh, Data Lake, Iceberg, and S3, kind of like uh, managing your data. Uh, compute services are very uh, kind of uh, uh, choice. You can do Spark, where uh, we kind of like uh, concentrated the talking. Uh, you can do Ray, you can do Flink, uh, all of that uh, that are uh, either the, the, the Tori for uh, Scala kernel, or you can do Python, the DI Python, used by Spark, using uh, Ray, using uh, for Flink as well. Uh, for orchestration, Airflow for our UI, and kind of like our uh, uh, interactive ID, Jupyter Notebooks. And pretty much this is 100% open source components. Uh, so uh, if you have additional requirements, want to learn more, uh, come to the community. Uh, come share your requirements with us. Uh, help improve our documentation if there are things that are not clear uh, that, that needs to be addressed. And um, if you wanted to learn even more, and, and w tomorrow we have another talk where we're going to focus more into the data side of it. Uh, in uh, how to apply data quality into that, come to our talk. Same room, uh, 2.40 p.m. Um, and I think uh, with that, uh, I'll leave our uh, information in case you have questions. But I think we also have a few minutes. So if you have, guys have any questions, uh, let us know.